The major question of the debate between science and Christianity, we often will call it science and religion, but particularly for this conversation, for where my expertise can speak into, and for how it dominates the headlines, the conversation is between science and Christianity. And the major question of the debate is, if science contradicts church teaching, which is right? Many people date the conflict between science and religion, especially science and Christianity, to the work of Galileo in the 17th century when he put forward a heliocentric model of the universe. The predominant theory among European scientists, and it, we should recognize that in the 17th century, European essentially also meant Christian, was that the Earth was the center of the universe and the sun and all the planets rotated around it. This had become more tricky to hold on to as telescopes got better and we were able to observe that planets did not, at least through their path through the sky, appear to go directly around the Earth in the same way that the Sun, at least, appeared to go directly around, as did the Moon. This created a lot of really interesting scientific models, which I won't touch on this evening, but essentially most European scientists, and therefore most Christian scientists, working in Europe, were developing models that assumed that the Earth was at the center of the universe. This geocentric belief, geocentric meaning Earth at the center, was primarily based on interpretation. There isn't a verse in the Bible that specifically says the Earth is the center of the universe, but rather it has uh, verses about how the sun travels across the sky in Joshua 10.13, or Ecclesiastes 1.3, or Psalm 19.5, or other verses about how the earth is God's footstool and cannot be moved, which we find in the Psalms, like in Psalm 93 verses 1 and 2, or Psalm 104 verse 5, and so on. The idea of a heliocentric sun at the center model had been raised in European science as early as the 3rd century BCE um, in Greek philosophy by Aristarchus of Samos, and it was modeled by Copernicus in 1543, but Copernicus's writings didn't gain a lot of attention. It was Galileo's work and writing that brought the conversation around a heliocentric sun at the center model of the universe into public debate. The Catholic Church had generally had a positive relationship with scientific work. We should think especially of how the Catholic Church has supported scholastic and scientific work with its Jesuit scholars, the Jesuit order where men specifically turn their attention in priestly orders to science and study. But that's only as long as it's not contradictory to Catholic teachings. Galileo published at a time when the Catholic Church was fighting off the interpretive practices of Protestantism, which likely informed the problems that they had with his work. After a series of inquisitions over several years, Galileo was commanded by the Catholic Church to recant his teachings. He was found vehemently suspect of heresy. It's important to note he was found suspect of it, and vehemently so, but they did not formally charge him with heresy, because that would have required a death sentence. He lived for nine years under inquisitional house arrest and died at home in, uh, he died at home at the age of 77. A second historical event to note is the publication of Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species in 1859. As with Galileo, Darwin's publication was less a moment of pure inspirational genius and rather a sum of the work of many scientists before him and his own observations, but he's credited with the development of the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution, short summary, is that based on the observable diversity of species in contemporary life and the historical fossil record, the species that now exist on Earth have not always remained the same, but have been changed over time as the world around them gives better advantages to different mutations. Darwin published specifically about animal species, but he did ask some questions about the ancestors of what we know as Homo sapiens, and that's led him to be credited as the source of the theory that modern humanity and modern apes, monkeys, and chimpanzees descended from a common ancestor. It's important to distinguish that Darwin and modern evolutionists do not teach that man descended from apes. 
It's rather that man and apes, humans and apes, are descended from a common ancestor, not that humanity is descended from apes. It's a poor representation of the science to say it that way. Darwin's work and the work that followed around what we call the evolution of man, because this was a time when the word man was being used to encompass all of humanity, was coming up against the accepted Christian theory of the creation of species, especially humans, different versions of which are called intelligent design or creationism. In their present day forms, creationism reflects the belief that God has created everything exactly as it is without any form of evolution or change involved. And intelligent design often includes some form of change over time that's guided by an all-powerful deity. And it's important to note that these terms are sometimes used interchangeably. So sometimes people will say they're a creationist or someone is a creationist when what they essentially mean is intelligent design, reflecting some of the patterns of what we can observe in nature and the historical fossil record that things have changed over time or that things diversify based on their um, ecology, the world around them. But the important thing is that for both intelligent design and creationism, there is a central, all-powerful deity, the one whom Christians call God, who has organized and structured all of creation. Controversy raged within European and American Christianity for the next few decades, and in many ways culminated or what is best represented perhaps in the, what is now known as the Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925. So that's 95 years ago. A high school teacher in Dayton, Tennessee was found guilty of the then state crime of teaching evolution in a public school. There's a lot of very interesting backstory to the Scopes trial. It was essentially designed as a test case by the ACLU to push back against anti-evolution laws that were starting to creep into the books on state levels. And both the prosecution and defense attorneys, William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow, were nationally known celebrities. This was definitely meant to draw publicity to the small town of Dayton. It's a very complicated story where it's not quite as pure or as ideologically motivated, maybe as much as politically or just tourist dollars motivated as some modern depictions like the movie Into the Wind might think. Although the Scopes trial is less a natural outcome of the seeming conflict between science and Christianity and more an orchestrated event, it did play on the growing chasm in American Christianity that would come to be called the fundamentalist modernist controversy. This had begun with the Presbyterian Church USA in 1910 with their publication of what they would come to call the five fundamentals. This was in it was published in uh, response to the ordination of three men in the Presbyterian Church USA who said that they were not prepared to affirm the doctrine of Jesus's virgin birth. After this, the Presbyterian Church had a lot of conversation and a lot of very tense debate, and so they released in 1910 five fundamentals to which they said all Christians had to assent. These would be that the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit and it is inerrant, without error, that Christ was born of a virgin, that Christ's death was an atonement for sin, that Christ was bodily resurrected, and that Christ's miracles are all historical reality. The split between fundamentalists who adhered to those five fundamentals and those who were called modernists would spread in American Christianity through the next few centuries, informing, of course, the Scopes trial. On the screen now, you'll see a cartoon which some of you may even be familiar with. This still circulates, even though it was originally drawn 98 years ago, called The Descent of the Modernists. So for those of you who might not be able to see all the print, what we have is someone descending slowly into a cave, uh, three different humans who are walking down this flight of stairs, showing a departure from Christianity to a step down to the Bible not fallible. The next step down is man not made in God's image, the next step, no miracles, then no virgin birth, no deity, no atonement, no resurrection, agnosticism, and finally the bottom being atheism. This is essentially a forerunner of the slippery slope argument. If we compromise on something like the Bible's infallibility, we're going to slide deep down into atheism. It should be noted also, although I haven't found a scholarly 
note to support this, that the gentleman at the bottom stepping into atheism looks to me a lot like Sigmund Freud. So this split between fundamentalists and those who were called modernists would spread throughout the next few decades. And the fundamentalist modernist split is essentially considered to end at the Seminex schism in the Lutheran church, which was in the 1960s and 70s. So this conversation went on over a period of 50 to 60 years, obviously with, with some pauses in between for things like the Great Depression and World War II. But in the 1960s and up till the 1980s, members of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod were concerned that pastors were being taught the historical critical method of reading the Bible. You might remember the historical critical method is the method that I taught you about reading the Bible a few sessions back when we talked about methods for interpreting scripture. So the LCMS began to have requirements about what pastors were being taught, especially at Concordia Seminary, and called the professors and pastors there sort of to account theologically. And this created a division and a schism within that particular branch of the Lutheran Church. Churches that left the LCMS uh, over a requirement of adopting the five fundamentals eventually became what was known as the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches. And the AELC would eventually combine with the American Lutheran Church and the Lutheran Church in America to form the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America in 1987. And that is the denomination in which we stand. Most modern modernist churches don't identify with that term, but with denominational titles like ELCA, Presbyterian USA, or Methodist, or with the general labels of mainline Protestant or liberal Protestant. And fundamentalists that use that may use that term for themselves, but they may also fall into the category of evangelical or evangelical Protestant. So essentially, how it breaks down today is that there are a few questions that remain about the interaction between science and Christianity. First, between fundamentalism and modernism slash science, would be how does the creation of the world happen? For fundamentalists, they call it a six-day creation based on the pattern of creation described in Genesis 1, although it should be noted that that is actually a seven-day creation. Creation is not finished until God rests on the seventh day. But what, of course, modernists or scientists believe is looking at the fossil record and what we're able to determine through scientific measures is that the formation of our planet and the creation that got us to this point in history happened over millennia. Another question that often comes up is the creation of humanity. For fundamentalists, this is based on the taking of the woman from Adam's rib. So it's understood that male and female are created in the image of God and that the woman is created secondary to man as in Genesis 1 and 2. You may remember from past lessons that, or from past meditations that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are completely different creation stories in which one where the man and women man and woman are created simultaneously in God's image and the second one in which a genderless creature made of earth is made and only when it's split in two does it become male and female but that's getting nitpicky. Anyway, for fundamentalists, the creation of humanity is all about how God created humanity directly, not as a descendant of a possible um, ape-like ancestor, and that women were created from the rib of men. Scientific understandings and modernist understandings would look at this and instead understand the creation of man as a process of evolution, likely with help from God, with a God guiding and directing the process, but still looking at the fossil record and admitting that there have been steps towards what we now, as no, now know as Homo sapiens sapiens. Another big part of the debate still existing between fundamentalism and modernist or scientist views would be certain historical events in the Bible, like the worldwide flood of Noah or the conquest of Canaan that we see in the book of Joshua. For fundamentalists, because the Bible describes these events as happening, they have to have historically happened. For modernists and scientists, we recognize that there's not a lot of historical record to support the conquest of Canaan. There may have been some events of conquest, but it was not a countrywide complete takeover, as far as we can tell through archaeological records and through the fossil record. We have no evidence of a worldwide flood as depicted in the story of Noah. 
It should be noted that a hundred years of anti-science thought processes within fundamentalist and evangelical Christianity have likely contributed to some of its reaction to contemporary issues like climate change, vaccination, and mask use and social distancing, where we see a rejection of scientific principles and a prioritization instead of biblical principles. They see science and the Bible as opposed, and so when scientific conclusions ask people to change behaviors, they assert the primacy of scripture over it. In contemporary debate about science and Christianity, there are sometimes four camps described. Conflict, independence, dialogue, and integration. Conflict sees religion and science as inescapably in opposition to each other. In this view, science is an opponent of scripture, particularly between the theory of evolution and biblical teaching of creation. Some scientists share this view as well that sees religion as too divorced from reality to have a discussion with. Independence believes that religion and science are completely different modes of understanding with different purposes, methods, and languages. Science examines the physical characteristics of our universe, and religion seeks to understand its spiritual foundation and meaning. Science asks, how did we get here? Religion asks, why are we here? Galileo supposedly quipped, the intention of the Holy Ghost is to teach us how one goes to heaven, not how heaven goes. In the dialogue model, religion and science are distinct, but there are overlapping issues of interest to both, ranging from the origins of universe and of life to its path in the future. Medical ethics, environmental issues, climate change, the relation of our mind and our brain are among the issues that concern people of both science and religion. And finally, in the model of integration, science and religion are understood as partners, and theology should be done in conversation with experience of nature or theories that are common in science. Much of the Catholic Church's understanding of science today falls into this area, where science and religion are done together. Some of our final meditation questions tonight. Which model makes the most sense to you? Conflict? Independence? dialogue, or integration? When has science helped you in your faith or your personal life? When has faith helped you understand the physical world around you better? <laughs>